Hello, everyone. This is Stephanie Scott. Thank you so much for chiming in to the webinar. Um, I see we do have a good chunk of people on the phone already, but we're expecting over 40 people, so we'll give it a couple minutes for people to chime in. Um, you guys are all on listen-only mode, which means you will not be able to talk, unfortunately. This is just to help keep the noise down. Um, so I will go into some additional details how you can interact with webinar in a minute. We'll just let everyone call in. So thank you for chiming in, and we'll wait just a couple minutes. If you're just joining in, we're just waiting a couple minutes to let everyone get logged in and get called in. Uh, so we're just holding on for a minute. Thank you for your patience. All right, well, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, we're expecting um, quite a few people on the call. So um, thank you all for taking the time out of your day and spending your lunch with us to learn about the Water Fluency Program. Um, and thank you very much for your interest in the program. Uh, we're very, very excited that we're able to continue this. Um, Again, you guys are all on listen-only mode, so you will not be able to communicate uh, via the phone. Um, but on the panel on your webinar, you'll see that there's a question drop-down. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, uh, specifically towards the end when we're going to be doing a Q&A session, please type in your questions there, and I can see those, and I'll be able to um, you know, read all of those if there's common questions. Um, make sure that we get all of your questions addressed, and um, you can ask questions specifically for me or any of the panelists that are going to join us. Um, so if you have a specific question about how it has impacted one of their jobs or things like that, we're here to make sure that you are getting all of your questions heard as you're considering uh, registering for the program. So with that being said, I will continue. Um, My name is Stephanie Scott. I am the Leadership and Education Program Manager here at the Colorado Foundation for Water Education. I have been on board since October of last year, so relatively new to the job, but jumping in quickly and um, anxious to take over all the programs. For those of you that are not familiar with the foundation or may have not participated in any of our events or read our content in the past, I just wanted to give a brief overview of who we are and what we do. Um, so our role in the state is to provide unbiased and balanced information to the citizens of Colorado, to water professionals, to elected officials, really the whole gamut. And our vision is that um, through our content and through our programs, uh, the people of Colorado will be able to make more informed water decisions, um, and they'll be able to do this by understanding water and all its complexities and trade-offs. Um, and we design our programs and our content to be able to um, inform them. So I want to just real quick touch base on like our two main program areas, one of which is more of our physical, like participatory programs, and those are the programs that I run. They're called leadership and education programs. 
Uh, Water Leaders is an eight-month professional development course that we run. Um, the goal of that program is to develop a pipeline of water leaders in the state. We accept 15 people to the course every year, and it's a very comprehensive, intense program um, that digs into um, each individual personally and you know how they can grow their career within the water community. Um, the other program I run is Water Fluency, which we will be talking lots about today, so I don't need to go into much detail there. Uh, another category of programs that I run are our tours. Um, every year we do one big tour uh, that's two days and it covers a different basin across the, across the state and we rotate that every year. So this year we'll be down in southwest Colorado uh, touring in and out of Telluride, San Miguel and Dolores Basin um, and that will be happening in June. And we also have other mini tours that some of you have probably participated in in the past everything from urban bike tours, trans-basin diversion tours, um, in tours that look at the nexus between energy and water, um, and then we also have things like workshops every year to address you know, things like climate and how our climate is impacting our water decisions. Um, so all this stuff is on our website if you're interested in learning more and participating. And the fourth program that I run is called the Water Educator Network. Uh, this program is aimed at increasing the amount the quality and the effectiveness of water education in Colorado. Uh, this is a network of educators, both formal and non-formal, so everything from you know, K through 12 teachers to water festival coordinators at municipalities um, to nature centers and beyond. Um, and this network of educators benefits from shared tools, trainings, workshops we put on, uh, various communications and whatnot um, that's all um, geared towards and aimed at water education in Colorado. So those are the four main programs that I run. And then the other big component to what the Foundation for Water Education does is our content. So we have citizen's guides, which you can see a selection of them here. The citizen's guides are aimed at um, each each um, guide is a specific topic, and the thought is that you know someone can read that and pick it up, and in just a short amount of time, they will increase their knowledge on that topic. Um, some of the topics we have are water conservation, where your water comes from, uh, Colorado water law, which we have um, different versions of. That one's updated frequently, uh, trans-basin diversions, and beyond. Um, some of these guides will be used in the Water Fluency Program this year as homework and resources. So as participation, you will be given some of these guides as um, some content for background for courses. And then the other content program we run is our Headwaters Magazine, which is a staple in the water community. Um, you know, it, a lot of water professionals are reading this, and we're branching out to get this distributed more to uh, the general public and other people that may not be in the water profession. So every issue, we distribute about 5,000 copies of these. And this is a picture of our most recent one, which is all about um, public um, public health and public safety in water. So the main reason we are all here today is to learn about the Water Fluency Program. Here is a brief agenda of what we're going to cover. Uh, this is the first time we have done an informational webinar like this, so we hope this is beneficial and helps you um, sort of answer some of your questions on the program. Um, and um, if you still have additional questions after, feel free to contact me. But today we're going to go over what is water fluency, a little bit about how the program was developed, uh, what to expect from the class this year, a little bit about what we have planned. Uh, we have three test or three alumni that have been through the program on the phone with us today, and they're going to give us a brief testimony about um, their experience with water fluency and how it's impacted their job. And then we'll go into the registration and scholarship process and, of course, leave plenty of time for you guys to ask questions. So let's go. Um, I am going to turn it over. This is Kristen Maharg. I'm sure many, many of you on the phone know her. She is my predecessor and um, is really the mastermind behind this program. So I thought it would be best to bring her on the phone to give her insight and her knowledge of what water fluency is since she created it and has a lot more institutional knowledge of how it was developed and the goals 
of the program. So I will turn it over to her. Kristen, are you there? I am. Thanks, Stephanie. I think that's the first time I've been called a mastermind, so I appreciate the introduction. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, I um, I appreciate the opportunity to um, tell folks a little bit about um, why water fluency exists in Colorado and kind of the history um, of developing this program. So you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so I, I came on staff. Um, with the Foundation for Water Education in 2008, but we as an organization have been helping Colorado speak fluent water since 2002. Um, through our publications, tours, and workshops, we were seeing increasing success and participation where our events were selling out. Um, water Leaders was a very competitive application process, and some of those applicants were looking for more of a content course rather than a leadership course. Um, so as we were maturing as an organization and better defining our strategic goals, um, we realized that the foundation has a niche of offering highly interactive learning experiences, um, which include diverse perspectives and producing these high quality professional development um, opportunities. Nobody in Colorado was really offering a comprehensive Water 101 training. Um, specifically for professionals engaged in local decision making. And so we saw that there was an opportunity there, so we started talking to um, some of our key partners and stakeholders across the state, um, such as adult educators, local elected officials, um, several organizations were instrumental in helping us define the need for water fluency, so Special Districts Association, the Colorado Municipal League, as well as Colorado Counties, Inc. Um, and we went through this formal needs assessment and a series of focus groups um, to help us develop the specifics of the water fluency program, um, which resulted in the framework of an immersion course. I think of it as, you know, being really immersed um, in, in the culture, the language um, of Colorado water. It has such a complex management system um, and so we wanted a course that um, efficiently and effectively addresses those most pressing issues in Colorado water it's certainly not um, you know a graduate program but we are thinking about folks that have day jobs um, people that are involved in water um, that might not have any background training or knowledge in water and, and they need a trusted and reliable source to come to and kind of get a snapshot of everything that's going on in the state and how it's relevant and applicable at the local level. Um, so Water Fluency was designed um, to give you the tools and confidence to navigate that world um, and to speak the language, become fluent in water, and then also analyze how you can create lasting change um, at either local or state level. Um, so like I said, our target audience um, does include public officials and community leaders involved in decision making and, and those water adjacent, so to speak, folks are um, people like county commissioners and planning staff, uh, municipal officials, water district board members, um, directors of community organizations that specialize in agriculture, or environmental and recreational needs, um, economic development interests. Um, we also know that the course is sought after by um, emerging professionals that are new to Colorado Water Resources Management, so engineers, consultants, attorneys. Um, so the course is open to everyone, so we, you know, it's first come, first serve. We don't turn anyone away, and I think what um, one of the the benefits of participation is that you're surrounded by people that are, you know, in their late 20s and just getting a kickstart in their career from folks that are in their early 70s and have retired but are a volunteer on their local water district board. Um, so you get just a really dynamic group of folks that are learning together, that are processing all these current policy challenges and then are trying to come up with some really creative solutions um, as a collective. Um, so you can go ahead to the next slide, Stephanie. 
Um, as a result of that needs assessment process um, and the curriculum design, we came up with four main outcomes that we hope each water fluency graduate will achieve. Um, so I just wanted to outline these because um, this is the guiding framework. This is um, what um, dictates program development and delivery. Um, so that first one there, we want to build a foundational awareness for each participant um, by imparting accurate knowledge and understanding of water resource management issues in Colorado. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. And the second one is really um, looking at the interconnections and intersections of water. So where are the relationships between both your personal and professional activities and timely water topics, whether that's um, land use and planning or whether that's um, you know, economic development and, and industry regulation, um, whether that's creating like local markets for, for agriculture and water transfers. Um, and so those um, interconnections are much more complex and nuanced, but we, we take those um, local issues that are happening and kind of um, look at it from a bigger picture. Um, we also, the third one, we want to help you define your own values and attitudes about water. So um, what are some informed opinions that you can um, synthesize from the information and the knowledge that you're getting from water fluency? And then, of course, finally is that critical thinking piece, um, giving you an opportunity to analyze um, both current and historical water-related conflicts. Um, interacting with our um, our lecturers and our um, guest guest speakers to really hear the juicy details of what um, all these conflicts um, brought about with the kind of change that um, was inspired as a result of some of those more challenging times and then what's to come. So how can we learn from the past in order to develop some creative alternatives um, towards resolution around future water issues. Um, so that's kind of just a background of where this program came from, why it is so unique in Colorado, um, and what we, what our kind of desired outcomes are. So I'll hand it back over to Stephanie, but I'll stay on the line if there's any questions later on. Awesome, thank you so much, Kristen. And just as a reminder to people, I know we've had some new people jump on the phone. You guys are all on mute, so you can't uh, ask us a question, but you can type in your question throughout the whole webinar, and we will address those questions at the end, so make sure um, you keep those questions coming. All right, well, let's continue. So here's just some quotes we've got from participants um, that have participated in the past. Um, you don't need to read to the, through these in too much detail, um, but you know we're getting really, really positive feedback. Um, here is just a snapshot of some of the evaluation that we've received. So we, each participant goes through a pre and post survey um, to sort of gauge some of those goals and objectives of the program that Kristen was talking through to make sure that our program is effective. And again, you don't need to read all the details in here. The big takeaway from this screen is that the green was the pre-surveys and the orange is the post-surveys. And so you can see that you know, participants do feel um, that their knowledge is increasing, their understanding is increasing, um, you know, their network's growing, all of that fun stuff. So. Um, Again, don't read into this in too much detail. I just wanted to show you a snapshot. You will be receiving a follow-up email um, after the webinar, and inc I will include in that the complete evaluation from last year, um, which you'll be able to pick through and read some of the more specific comments about what the program was to individuals. So you will be receiving that later today. Um, and we're going to go into a little bit about what to expect this year, sort of the program design and some of the topics that we'll cover. Um, so, the training sessions, historically, there have been four half-day sessions-ish. Um, we This will be the third year that the program is running, and it'll be the first time that it's on the West Slope. So, we've changed up the format just slightly. We will ha still have four days of um, 
in-person sessions, but the first two have been lumped together. And there's a couple reasons we did this. Um, people are going to be traveling from farther distances, so one was to reduce travel, but also a lot of the feedback we were getting was that by the fourth class, people felt like they were just getting to know each other and that they were really earning for more and wanting more interaction. And so we're hoping that having uh, the first two sessions back to back, um, we're having a group dinner that night together, possibly people staying at the same hotel, we can really try to jumpstart that camaraderie between class members to really build, start building your network from the start. Um, and hopefully that will help um, you know, with the relationships and the network that you build. Um, site visits and local professionals, so at every session we will have a combination of the two um, and we will bring in local people to talk about you know, their roles, how their jobs um, you know, impact water, you know, challenges, successes, all that fun stuff. Um, readings, this will be a combination, I mentioned the citizens guides before, it's also going to be some online case studies, potentially like legal documents or scientific papers to give you a little bit more background on some of the topics that you can read before each session so you feel when you come in to the class, you have enough of a background knowledge to participate in discussions and understand in what some of the panelists or people are talking about um, so you're sort of prepared for each session. Uh, there will also be an online content, which we've partnered with uh, CSU's, their online platform. And some of this will be video lectures from the university itself that you guys will watch and learn from. There'll be a discussion forum on there where we will all interact in between sessions, as well as some quizzes and, you know, some other stuff. Um, and really, there's a bunch of bunch of stuff on there that you could tap into, um, and we will have it structured where you know here's sort of the required content, and then here's you know if time was endless, you can you know explore all of this information. Uh, so the reflections and homework um, we talked about, you know, some of the online stuff will be homework, some of the readings. Um, Kristen said that it's probably about five hours of homework in between each session, so you can use that to gauge, um, you know, how, you know, you think this course may interact with your work and uh, personal life. Um, but some of these homework assignments will be, you know, interviewing a water manager, sitting down and asking them questions, monitoring stream gauges, just some activities that will get you closer um, in touch with water, um, and we're going to help you, you know, think through, you know, how to utilize some of these homework um, assignments to you know, capitalize on your job. Um, and then the certification at the end. So the certification is um, you will receive certification if you have completed 75% or more of the course. So the way that the program is designed, um, you don't have to participate in all of the readings, all the online content, all of the homework, and even all of the sessions. Um, but of course, the more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. And in the end, in order to receive your certification, you are required to have at least completed 75% of the course curriculum. Um, all right. So this is, I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail here. If you guys have more questions on specifics about each session, um, I'm happy to answer those. So type your questions in or reach out to me after. Um, but what to expect for 2017. Here is a bulleted um, list of some of the topics we'll cover in the first two-day session. That'll be held in Glenwood, and it's essentially an introduction to Colorado's water resources and water law. Um, so this first session will really um, start from the foundation, where water, you know, water management came from, water law, um, managing water resources, how environmental protection regulations um, roll into that, um, and really just set a good foundation for the rest of the course. Session two is June 29th in Palisade, and this will focus more on, um, you know, water resource management and protection that is happening now. So, so how do, on a daily basis, are water professionals and water managers, you know, looking at the resource, you know, quantity versus quality, um, you know, how do different stakeholders interact with each other, and whether different roles between, you know, local local organizations and statewide organizations. Um, all that fun stuff. We'll also go into, you know, how are water projects financed and the permitting and how all of that um, is incorporated into making water decisions. So this session is really all about sort of water management on a daily basis and how we all interact as a state together. 
And then the third and final session will be water management for the future. So we have a foundation about, you know, what is water, how understanding water rights, law, all that fun stuff that we've talked about, you know, how water is managed. And now we're going to talk about sort of what what can we walk away from this class and how can we take what we learned in the class and really apply it to our jobs. So, you know, understanding, you know, what does this water supply gap mean? You know, how do we identify solutions? You know, creative alternatives. We'll look at case studies on, you know, um, non-traditional partnerships, people coming together to create um, solutions that are sort of non-traditional, you know, water management techniques. Um, and then you will also have the opportunity, so a special districts association will be co-hosting this last session, so we'll have a joint luncheon with them, and the lunch panel um, will be a, a big panel that we'll all uh, be a part of together, and then you guys will have an option of staying and listening to their fall membership meeting, so it'll be people from all over the Colorado um, coming to talk about water, so it'll be an additional content that you guys will have the opportunity to interact and meet their members and network with the greater um, water community. All right, so I'm going to turn it over now to some of our panelists and people that have participated in this course before, and they're going to take um, some time to walk through uh, the question that I have given them is, how did the Water Fluency Program impact your knowledge and understanding of water resources and water management in Colorado, and how did it influence making water decisions with your job then and now? And so we're going to give each of them the stage um, to give us a little bit of insight on how water fluency has impacted them. So first we have Josh Nims. He is currently a senior water resource engineer with the city of Westminster. Josh, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here, Stephanie. Thanks. Awesome. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thanks again for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. I had yeah. a very positive experience with the water fluency program. Uh, I was uh, I was fortunate to get into the course as kind of a late enrollee, and my and my scramble to enroll was influenced by partly the expectations I had for the course. I had just come off uh, not being selected for the water leaders program, but I still wanted to pursue continuing education and, and hopefully prepare myself for the Water Leaders Program in the future. In addition, uh, the city had hired a new senior water resources engineer to be a colleague in our group, and she had been enrolled in the course, and I felt like it would be a good opportunity for us to take the course together as kind of onboarding and just kind of learning together and, and then sharing my experience with Westminster compared to what we are learning in the fluency course. So, so that worked out to kind of sign up with uh, my colleague, Megan, and do the course together. So, you know, I really think these expectations were, were more than met. Uh, you know, through the course, I did really get to learn more about the foundation and, and connect with foundation folks and get a better understanding of the program and its, its mission and really, I think, learned ways to kind of have a stronger application for the Water Leaders Program, which now I am uh, a part of that class for this year. Uh, moreover, it really was the perfect venue for kind of a building relationships with a new colleague. So that I, I felt, you know, kind of a unique for me to be able to take the course with, with a colleague, but somebody who was pretty new to the water resources. We got to uh, kind of commute together and, and discuss the homework, the, the presentations and, and the topics and compare them to Westminster and what, what we're doing and if they'd work for us. And it, it just really became a, a great opportunity to get uh, some onboarding and some relationship building with my new colleague. So really a kind of big picture, you know, even being within the municipal water management for, for a number of years, I really felt like I learned a lot from this program specific to understanding and knowledge of, of Colorado water management. I was really impressed with the content, the level of the presenters. I mean, we really had the people who were involved in some of the topics, you know, really key experts giving presentations and being accessible and available to kind of tell us how they did it. And I, that was just really impressive. And Megan and I commented often on the opportunity we had to have these people giving us presentations uh, the, you know, the 
organization of the program is really well done and thought out with the tours and the, the times to reflect on what we learned. I just felt like it was really valuable. And, and as it's been discussed already, it really is timely. It's very relevant topics that and themes that we're, you're hearing about in the water world in Colorado. The, we had topics on the Colorado Water Plan and the funding of the plan, the cooperative agreement, and the people who were involved in those aspects of those major Colorado topics. So it was really a, a cool opportunity to be kind of hearing it from the people involved. Um, let's see, furthermore, you know, I was just really, and this was talked by Kristen too, just to be exposed to the variety of, of folks that are involved in the class, you know, my classmates. There was really just a, a broad variety of folks with lots of different perspectives and backgrounds and diversity. And just to kind of be able to connect with those guys, get to hear their perspectives and viewpoints is really valuable. And we're kind of insulated here when you get into your job and to kind of get out there and, and hear what people are doing with their challenges and their problem solving and, and ways that they're they're doing things was just really refreshing and, a, and good to get exposed to that again and get out there and see what how people are doing things that we can apply here at Westminster. So that was really a valuable uh, aspect and and I I felt like we you do build connections with those classmates and I can reach out to them and and continue to kind of have discussions or problem solve or ask for advice and and, and I really found that uh, as a, a good take home benefit to this program. Uh, the course has a lot of materials that I really still refer to. It really kind of consolidates a lot of helpful Colorado water management materials for you and, and we, we still uh, use them in our kind of day-to-day -day work for uh, reference and it's, it was really helpful to have some of the foundational materials there at your fingertips and, and, and much appreciated. So really I'm uh, you know, I guess in conclusion, was really happy that I was, uh, and, and fortunate that the foundation worked with me to kind of get me squeezed into the course at kind of the last minute, and it, it really turned out to be a, a fantastic course that had only positive things to say about it. So thank you, and I'll be on the line too for questions. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much for all of that, Josh. Um, all right, next up we have Erin Cooper, and she is on the line. She's calling in, currently working uh, with Boulder County, but at the time she had a different job. So, Erin, are you there? <laughs> yep, I'm here. All right, awesome. Well, if you want to sort of walk us through, you know, what you were doing in your transition a little bit and tell us how the water fluency impacted you. Sure. Um, I'll start by saying that I was able to participate in the course through a scholarship offered by Larimer County and I'm super grateful for that because I think that this course was a really good opportunity for me to um, transition from what I had been doing prior to my last job um, which was more focused on education and outreach in actually marine science and how watersheds in Colorado are connected to the ocean. Um, so. In my last job, I was a watershed coordinator for one of the watershed coalitions uh, that were formed after the 2013 floods. And so I worked directly every day with a grassroots coalition of um, a landowner-driven board, and we worked to funnel some flood recovery funding from the state and the federal government into recovery projects throughout our watershed. Um, and that in itself was an eye-opening experience for somebody that had been coming from an educational world um, and hadn't directly worked with local Colorado communities. And so um, the, the background knowledge that I learned through the Water Fluency course um, helped me really connect with the local community I was working with at the time. And from there, just opened up this whole world of understanding Colorado water, uh, the different perspectives that influence Colorado water management decisions. Um, I admit that I had a, pr a fairly narrow perspective on local water issues prior to the course, um, but I definitely don't consider that to be the case anymore. Um, one thing that I feel like I really um, didn't know anything about was Colorado water law and how local water rights 
determine so many different decisions. Uh, so I'm, I'm, it's really helpful to have that background knowledge, uh, both in my past job and now in my current position with Boulder County, uh, because I'm still working with local communities. And uh, it's definitely helpful to know why certain decisions are made, say, up in the canyons of Boulder County, as opposed to in the uh, more urban areas of the county or out in the plains areas. Um, so understanding those variations of perspectives of water and living near water um, in these different areas of the state um, is really beneficial. Um, what I didn't really expect from the course is it was an opportunity to have frank conversations with farmers and ag producers and water providers, um, including folks like Josh. Um, that was eye-opening as well. I never thought I'd be in, in a classroom with farmers from Greeley talking about how they've um, thought about water conservation issues and actually saved themselves lots of money by incorporating water conservation practices into their business. Um, and then at the same time, talk with folks about how, you know, the typical boulderite thinks about their impact on Colorado water um, and different entitlement perspectives, I guess. Um, I, it was really humbling to be a part of the course and have these conversations over lunch and during breaks in the class, as well as ask questions of uh, the folks we went to visit on our field trips, like at Northern Water, um, at Bagerber Farms, where we learned about their onion production. Um, and I know you guys won't be participating in those specific um, field trips since you'll be out on the Western Slope, but I definitely um, benefited greatly from the field trips. Um, in terms of time commitment for the course, I was fortunate enough to sort of spend my Sundays during the during the course period, um, kind of making those my homework days, hanging out at my house or at a coffee shop, um, going through the course materials, and being able to focus on uh, on the coursework for a couple hours on those weekends. Um, I didn't always get to the extra work, but I I perused it enough to know that it was super valuable. So, not in addition to the the binders that you'll walk away with, all of the online resources are incredibly valuable and um, there's qu answers to any sorts of questions you might have about Colorado water. Um, and I, I keep my binder at my desk, similar to Josh as well. Um, <laughs> and I guess really the big takeaway was how impressed I was by the foundation's connection to people in all aspects of the water world. Um, throughout the state. Um, the staff is a great resource and I've really felt supported um, if I've had questions since the course ended and I feel like as an alumni of the course I could call up CFWE uh, with a question and they'd connect me to exactly the person I needed no matter where they are in the state. So thank you CFWE. <laughs> well thank you Erin, that was great. All right, and then our third and final alumni of the program is Milt Tokunaga. Um, at the time when he took the course, he was the mayor of Milliken. Uh, so, Milt, are you on the phone? Yes, Stephanie. Awesome. Well, yeah, we're going to let Milt sort of talk about his perspective of the course as uh, participation as an elected official. Thank you for the invitation, Stephanie, and, and um, <clears throat> this is just a shout out to Kristen, who uh, was extraordinary in leading this this uh, this class. My reason for the class was I I didn't feel like I had enough background in the water as a public of water information as far as a public official goes, and uh, the, I floundered the first year two years just trying to reach out to other individuals, particularly um, <clears throat> in Greeley with the um, um, mayor there, and Evans, Windsor, some of the other municipalities, but everybody's got their own perspective and, and many times it comes down to, uh, at that time my thought was, well, it's urban versus versus agriculture and, and you find out through this course 
um, that it's much, much more so than that. It's, it's interdependent, not only within jurisdictions, but interdependent whether it's a uh, economic standpoint, conservation standpoint, if it's recreational, if it's environmental. Uh, there's all sorts of issues that come to come to uh, come to light, and it's and it's not just within Colorado. We find out that the compacts that we had signed way back when have a huge impact, probably more so than we ever thought. Now, because of the drought situation, with other states in the lower compact as well as the upper compact. So. Quite honestly, I, I never looked at it that way because as a coming from a small town and we were about 6,000, um, you think that, hey, I, I need to plan a little bit for the future, whether it's um, you rely on the staff a lot, whether it's for what were you doing for storage, what about um, future pipelines and maintenance, et cetera. But as a public official, you need to be looking more beyond that. You need to be looking at five, 10, 15, 20, 25 years down the road where maybe your population now grows for double or you know we're expected to be at something something around 17,000 in uh, roughly about um, 15 to 20 years. So that says you better start planning now because this is not just a short-term project. It's an ongoing project. So the knowledge here is, is extremely important to get the background knowledge uh, and why decisions were made and how they're made. So a lot of the guests that we had, the experts that we had, anywhere from um, we had a Supreme Court, Colorado Supreme Court Justice in, uh, uh, I can't recall the, I think it was uh, Justice Hobbs was his name. But we're, he actually ruled on much of the the issues that came before the court, or John Stolp, who was the governor's, or maybe still is the governor's water policy advisor, and and um, Jim Eklund, who is the board for the water, the color water conservation. So those experts have a, have a little bit more of an insight, uh, like a lot more insight than the people that I've necessarily talked to, and I would rely on, say local area farmers or people who had some institutional knowledge about the town. Uh, one of the things, the takeaways is that um, that I had attending the course and throughout um, while I was mayor here is that it is not a go it alone type of issue that needs to be addressed. It's a regional issue so you have to get input and if you want to try to solve some of these problems now, unlike what maybe before we just dig a ditch and bring in the the water to the farms, et cetera, um, since it's a limited resource, you really have to have some um, collaboration with some other jurisdictions. So we did set out or participate in other with other communities on some conferences and, and started addressing a little bit more of some um, regional type process, like potentially a regional type of processing plant for water in this northern Colorado area. I created a, a water commission because much of when you're an elected officials, you rely on staff a lot, but that doesn't mean that they don't have other issues to address. And this is one of the areas that should be front and center and always come up not just when we need to say, okay, well, our water rates aren't quite what they should be, so we need to be addressing that. Or maybe our storage issue is 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 lacking and it's dropped until the next budget season or whatever, and then it's addressed at that point in time. So um, I would encourage if there's any potential or elected officials out there that they should really participate in this because uh, the process is, doesn't just stop because you're elected or or you you are um, not in an elected capacity any longer. It's a process that needs to be ongoing, and there needs to be some continuity in that, and not just drop. One of the things that um, we uh, 
started doing is that during the, not only just during the budget process that but you had to have a review of what was happening on projects. Staff likes projects, so if there's a water storage, which we we uh, had built a uh, storage tank, which was been talked about for 20 years, but the process and it's a lot longer process just for that particular project. Well, um, tell me about how that affects the distribution, the water pressure, the the um, raw water that you have to get from the uh, from water providers, and how does that integrate with what we we uh, su how we supply the rest of the constituents within the town? So we, we actually had several different water rights. Did we need them? We couldn't we couldn't even use some of the water rights what we had for processing purposes. So uh, in the past, why did we? <laughs> the question is. Why do we have the water rights here if the city of Greeley is not going to process that water? Just because it's raw water doesn't necessarily mean it's valuable to us uh, now or down the road. So we did trade some water rights for some water that we could actually utilize. So, um, you know, other things that came about, we, we had, we, uh, Josh was talking about the flood of 2013 and, and we were impacted tremendously with that and what part of we learned from there as well as or I learned from the water um, <clears throat> fluency class is that um, about stormwater convergence and attenuation and what you know, it, it, it impacts us there but beyond that because of the flood that's gone we don't need to worry about it wrong really need to start start to look at it in a more a proactive manner, and we actually didn't have stormwater fees here in town. Um, we do now, not that it makes everybody happy, but you know, the political costs, I, personally, I didn't worry about any political costs because I felt like, hey, this is what's needed in order to have a um, sustainable and, and safe municipality. So those are some things that, um, you know, I guess I took away from it that this is a much more long-lasting type of um, issue, and just the, the the water fluency class itself really just brought to light is you know you've kind of been thinking about this but you really never did and you really didn't have any background for it but but now it, this is more in a step-by-step -step process of of some things that needs to be addressed at the time or that you need to be addressing I should say. So that's somewhat how I utilize the class. Um, I am no longer the mayor here in Millican um, because I, I knew that that's, I would be moving here to a, a smaller a step down because I was on some acreage here. So um, I'm moving to another town, but I hope to be involved a little bit more in the the Water Commission Water Board in town. Um, I would I would echo. Josh and Aaron's comments as the as to the value that this class has, and um, my initial statement that I would encourage a lot more publicly elected officials to participate. I think we had maybe two of us, maybe three of us in the class, and and um, unless there's a good understanding, background understanding. I don't. I don't see how any municipality can, um, particular small ones, can make any kind of good decisions. Larger municipalities, whether it's Westminster or Boulder or Greeley, have that staff that stays up on top of it. Um, small towns um, don't have that. Um, you might say the the availability of that. Unless you do start participating in classes like that, they 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 don't have the resource to be able to have that staff um, to help them out. Well, thank you. That was very um, very good examples of how you were able to apply some of the stuff. Thank you so much, Melt. Um, and again, all three of them will still stay on the line. We have about ten minutes left. Um, so again, if you have any questions, please type them in, and we'll get to those. Uh, before we hit questions, I just wanted to cover. Um, real quick, the registration process. 
So um, we have recently changed the registration process. If you went on there and tried to register before and didn't or whatnot, um, I just wanted to review sort of what to expect to, when you register now. Um, so the tuition is $1,250. It includes all the training, the course materials, lunch for the session, site visits, online courses, um, pretty much everything you need to participate in the course. Um, it's currently open. Um, we're currently about um, halfway to capacity, and we will close the course as, um, when we hit 30 people. Um, when you go to the website to register, this will be, we've added this um, little yellow section um, to the registration process. So essentially, everyone will be registering, and your application will come to us. And we are going to use that to prioritize the scholarship. So we've been very fortunate to get funding to provide scholarships to about 50 to 60 percent of the course. So we're hoping most people can have a scholarship of some sort. Um, you'll see on this main page there's a, a list of some of the scholarships that may be available to you know SDA members or Colorado Municipal League members, things like that. Um, but we do have other scholarships, and so. That what happens when you register is you'll register, you'll get on the list, um, and then based on your feedback, if you filled out the scholarship request, um, we will go ahead and place and try to pair uh, the scholarships with the register, with, um, all of you uh, registering. So if you are thinking about registering, uh, please do. Um, the course will fill up um, pretty quickly here. And so go ahead and go online and register. Uh, you will receive, um, after you register, you'll receive an email like this that says that it's awaiting approval, which means we've received your registration. Um, and between now and April 7th, we'll be communicating back and forth with you on sort of where the status of your application is. Um, by, a, by April 7th, we will have the final um, scholarships paired and matched and all that stuff. So um, if you do receive a scholarship, you will be notified of that, and then you'll sort of be notified on the remainder of the payment that's due. And at that time, if you are unable to participate because of financial reasons or whatever it may be, um, you can withdraw your registration. Um, but again, take away from this, if you're thinking about registering, please do so. Um, you will get put on the list, and we will be working, you know, for about the next month on pairing people and try to, you know, fulfill all those scholarship um, applications. And I think that's the big picture. Um, these are our sponsors for our scholarships, so I just wanted to give a shout out and thank them um, for the scholarships that they've been able to offer. And again, April 7th will be like the deadline when everyone sort of hears what their uh, registration status is and you'll be able to withdraw or complete your registration at that time. Um, and then these are our bigger sponsors for the whole program. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to them. We do have local sponsors for each of the individual sessions um, that are sponsoring lunch. You know, for example, Anna Darko is sponsoring lunch for one of the Glenwood sessions, things like that. So uh, we couldn't do this without our sponsors, um, and we are very much looking forward to uh, the class and you know bringing some of these professionals to, to you. Um, yeah, let's see. I will. Look through questions now. Um, so one of the questions we had was, have the locations been decided on yet for people that have registered uh, to make like hotel arrangements and all that stuff? Um, we are close to finalizing that, and um, we will notify you as soon as we do. Uh, we will be sending out the final packet with location details, um, hotels if needed, all of that stuff that we've arranged um, the week after April 7th when we have the final class. So you will essentially get your first packet of information, here's all the details, as well as here's the homework that you need to start working on before the class. So you'll have um, at least, you'll have like a little, a little more than three and a half weeks to get your first set of homework done before the first session. And it looks like um, most of these other questions I think have been answered. There was questions about homework. So again, um, as much as you put into it is what you will get out of it. Um, but you know, Kristen, with her experience and running the program in the past, 
had suggested that it would be about five hours in between each session. Um, yeah, I think I think all these other questions have been answered. Um, so any any final questions we have out there, or any of the panelists have a final word that they'd like to throw out? <laughs> No. All right. Well, I'm hoping that um, that means we have accomplished our mission of this webinar in informing you all on what to expect and set some realistic expectations for the course. So hopefully we've done our job and that's why um, there aren't more questions. Uh, but again, you will be receiving a follow-up email uh, today that will include an evaluation from last year that you can pick through and look at for some additional feedback. And you will also um, be getting a recording of this. You can go back and listen to it. We'll post the recording online. So if you had any things you wanted to fall back on and look at. Uh, thank you again to our panelists for helping out um, and for providing some insight that I yet cannot offer because I have not gone through the course. Uh, so thank you very, very much for taking the time out. And please feel free to reach out to me. Um, here is my contact information if you have any questions. All of the information for the program is on our website, as well as with all the registration instructions and whatnot. So thank you very, very much. And we will um, hopefully hear from you all shortly. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good luck. Mm-hmm. <laughs>